Clustering is such a big part of distributed systems. And in this episode, we're going to learn how we can implement clustering inside of Microsoft Orleans with my friend Ruben Bond. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the On.net show. My name is Celso Philip, and in this episode, we're gonna continue our exploration of Microsoft Orleans, and we're gonna learn how clustering works within that ecosystem. And in this particular episode, I have my friend Ruben Bond, who's back again, who's gonna give us some ideas about like how does Orleans clustering really work underneath the covers. Ruben, how are you doing, my friend? Hey, Cecil, doing very well, how are you doing? Good, good. You know, I really appreciate you spending the time over these last few episodes to really help us understand like how Orleans works. And, you know, I know clustering is a big thing when it comes to scaling out the instances that we have. So I really mm -hmm. want to dive in and, and get a better understanding of how that works. Could you, you think you can help us with that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. All right. I, we've got some slides here we can look at um, and we can look into more detail about how this actually works. Sure. So, we talked about in the last couple of episodes about this application that we were building, this uh, dictionary called Hanbaba, right? And and that was kind of a typical sort of an architecture for an Orleans app where you have a web server and you have Orleans in the same process, and then you want to be able to scale it out, let's say on Kubernetes or something. Now, the question is always, when you scale this thing out and you're using Orleans, how do you actually get those different instances of your application to talk to each other? And really, that's actually what we want to talk about today, which is how do we actually make a, a application instance over here talk to other instances of itself? And, and so essentially, we're talking about these green lines here. For all leans to work properly, getting these green lines to work is very, very important. So the kind of questions that we want to answer are, how do the instances of our app find each other? What happens when we scale the application out? And then if something fails, maybe maybe we shut down one of the servers or we scale something in, what happens then? The short answer for all of this is that we use in Orleans a database. So all of the different instances of our application, they're going to go and talk to some central database in order to find each other. And so it's kind of like a rendezvous point where they all meet. And what this database has, is just a regular kind of a database. It could be um, Redis, or it could be a table storage in Azure, or it could be Cosmos DB. It helps to answer the question, who is a part of this cluster? So who are the other uh, application instances that are around? And what's their current status? And so the typical kind of thing is you might have, you know, reading updates from this table and then go in making making updates to it. So you're, you're reading and writing from the table. So how does that actually look in code? Now, if you remember from the last video, we talked about how to host that HanBaoBao app in Kubernetes. And we said that for our inner loop development, when we're in Visual Studio or we're running from the command line, and we want to be able to hit F5 or run .NET run on our application, we just want to be able to use a simple local host clustering. We don't want to bother setting up any infrastructure. And so we have this one line that says, let's just use some local host in memory clustering. But then when we actually deploy to production, we wanted to use Redis. And so in this case, we we're gonna pull an environment variable out from the, from the definition that Kubernetes uh, gave us from our pod spec and then configure Redis with some connection string. And for most people, that's all they ever end up seeing from clustering is how do I configure it and then assume that it works from there. And generally speaking, it, it works well uh, and they don't really need to look into it in further detail. But it's nice, I think, to to look behind the covers and think what actually happens behind the scenes and demystify some of this. So if we want to look a little bit deeper, we might start by saying, well, what does that cluster membership table that we talked about over here actually look like? And the answer is it looks something like this. So it, it's a very simple kind of a thing, and this is obviously made up data, but essentially you have this this table with a few different columns, and you have things like an ID that the that the server comes up with when it first starts up, some way of contacting it, so that ends up being its IP address and some port, its status, and then this suspectors column. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. 
Um, but essentially, this is crucial for working out uh, who is still alive and in, in active in the cluster and which instances are stopped, et cetera. And so this is part of keeping everything healthy. I did have one quick question I wanted to ask yeah, you sure. about the clustering. And you know, I think clustering is such one of those underrated features inside of Orleans. Like when I think about mm -hmm. if I had a plain old ASP.NET application and I had to cluster it, right? Like I had to have multiple instances of these things and have them also know where each other are and have them talking to each other. I could only imagine the amount of code that I'd have to actually write to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, so out of the box, I'm assuming clustering means like I can have multiple instances of the same application, right? Is That's it right. Yep. is there a situation or is, is it possible that I can have different types of Orleans applications within the same cluster? So again, different code bases, so different silos, different sets of grains, but have them in the same cluster. Is that is that a thing that's supported? Yeah, for sure. So we call that in the docs heterogeneous clusters. And the idea is just that you have your different Orleans, um, let's say code bases, your, your different executables rather. Um, and when they when they connect to each other, they essentially negotiate, okay, uh, which grains do you have or which, which code is available on you and which code is available over here? And then they work out between them. You know, let's say that you wanted to have your user profile grains on, on one host and your uh, shopping cart grains on a different host or a different set of hosts. It'll automatically work out if I want to get a shopping cart grain, I need to go to these this set of hosts. And if I want to get user profiles, I need to talk to this other set of hosts. So it'll do that for you automatically. You don't need to do anything for that. So there, you can configure um, specifically to say this host allows these grains and this host allows those grains, but you don't need to. It'll just pick it up by looking at the assemblies that it has. Awesome. Yeah. So. So we want to talk about uh, how does the cluster membership in Orleans actually maintain the health of the cluster? And that's really the meat of this is, is uh, how do we work out which servers are there? How do we make sure that when something goes wrong that we account for it? The short answer is that every server or every application instance monitors several other servers. And then by doing that, that also means that every server gets monitored by several other servers. And so when we say monitoring, really, we just mean that they send periodic health probes to each other, so ping messages. And then they expect to get responses, so pong messages. So it's like ping pong uh, to check, are you healthy? Yes, I'm healthy kind of a thing. And then if servers fail uh, to respond for a little while, let's say 10 seconds or 15 seconds, or it's a configurable value, of course, then they get declared down and removed from the cluster. And so. That means that if, if there were some grains on that server that were active, they're no longer accessible because that machine is actually gone. And so Orleans will go and reactivate them on some other machine the next time they're needed. And so it automatically heals from those kinds of events. And that's the kind of thing that happens when something scales down or if the machines crash or, or whatever reason. So if we're looking into the real nitty gritty details of this, one of the questions we have is who monitors who? And the answer to that is that you saw in that cluster membership table up here that each server has its own ID. So it's got a unique ID that it that generates on startup. And what we do is we take that unique ID, we create a hash of it, you know, similar to get hash code in, in C sharp, but it's a consistent hash. Uh, and then we sort them and arrange them to form this kind of a ring. So you might have seen diagrams that show, you know, um, servers arranged in a ring. So we call this a consistent hash ring, and we use these to determine who monitors who. The way that actually looks is there's a lot of arrows here because there's a whole bunch of servers, but if we're just looking at this one, you can see that it's monitoring these three other servers, these three ones that just come before it in the ring. So there's three arrows going out, and then you can see three different colored arrows coming in. So it's also being monitored by these three other servers here. And so each, so each server monitors three and gets monitored by three. And by doing that, we can make sure that if any one of them goes down, there's enough others to check that quickly and, and actually mark it as down and then start routing around it. So we can quickly heal from any kinds of faults that happen. Got it. Now, when, when you wanna actually jump, uh, scale out or, or have an uh, instance that restarts, it needs to first join the cluster. 
And so the way that that looks is it will read the table, find out in this case, hey, B is around and his, uh, you know, that server is at this address, then go and update the table and then go and talk to all of the other instances in the cluster to connect and say, hey, I've joined, here's where you can contact me. And so this is the process that happens anytime you scaled your cluster out or you restarted and, and it tries to form this, this cluster of servers. It's a pretty simple kind of process, but the more complicated thing is what happens uh, during monitoring. So, so let's say that in this case, A has to monitor B and it wants to find out, it wants to keep checking for its health. And so it sends a ping message, it gets a pong back. But then what if B goes down? So someone trips over the network cable or a cosmic ray comes and fries B's network card or its processor. And so it's not able to respond anymore. A is going to keep sending ping messages, but then it just won't get responses back in time. And so after a few missed responses, A then goes and updates that membership table to say, I suspect that something is wrong with B. Now, we call that a vote or a suspect. And you might have remembered seeing that in this table here. In, in this case, let's say that it was C. So A suspected that, that this instance was down at a certain time. Um, if we look at the more advanced case where you have multiple servers here, then A will try to ping B, B is down. So it'll go and suspect B, but then C is also pinging B. Uh, and it learns that A has already voted that B is down. And so once it says, okay, B has not responded to pings in quite a while, that's two votes. And by default, two votes is enough to say that B is definitely down. So everyone should forget about B and start routing around it. And so then C will go and update this table and disseminate that. Uh, it'll gossip that out to all the other machines. And so now after this point, after this point here, B is removed from the cluster and it can start healing. And that's really all there is to it. So that, that's really the gist of how clustering works in Orleans. Now, now with Orleans, is there a concept of a leader? Like, you know, I know sometimes there's you know, like a, a main node and then like worker nodes and, and things of that nature? Or is every node or uh, every silo within Orleans considered equal? Yeah, all silos, all servers in Orleans are considered equal. So there's no um, leader election that's required. It's more of a collaborative um, algorithm where it, everyone has the same sort of, sort of responsibilities. So responsibilities are shared equally. In fact, if you look at this, this ring that we talked about, um, if, if there was a leader, maybe, you know, let's say that this one up here was responsible for determining, uh, everyone else's health status. So everyone would come into this node to determine that. Well, they also need to work out what happens when this one goes down. Um, and so leaders could be a single point of failure potentially, but typically what a lot of systems do is that they'll use cluster membership as this base, and then they'll put some leadership algorithm on top of that. And so, you know, if you want to replicate data or something in your cluster, you pick different leaders for different partitions or something along those lines. So in Orleans case, everything is, everything is equal. Um, but then you might have leaders on top of that. So aside from this basic, uh, kind of health monitoring and things, there's also a few other complications that you might lean to. In the real world, um, we have this problem. We have this this issue that what what's really the difference between something that's crashed, so it's actually gone down, or something which is just slow, or maybe there's a temporary network issue. So the question is, can you tell the difference between them? And we'll answer that in a second. Um, but then a second thing to consider is, let's say that A is not receiving uh, responses back from B. Maybe the reason for that is because actually it's A that's unhealthy. Maybe A is disconnected from the network. Well, maybe A is just running so slowly. Let's say, for example, that there's severe thread pool starvation. And so it's getting messages back from B, but it just can't process them in time. And so after five seconds or something, it'll time out and say, oh, actually B is unhealthy. But in reality, it's A that's unhealthy. And so these are tricky kinds of things, but, but these happen in the real world. And, and actually some of them are impossible to solve. So in this case here, uh, if, we, if we look at the answers to this, in this case here, it's, it's actually no difference between something which is crashed and something which is slow, because you can never tell. Maybe 
maybe eventually B is going to get back to you, but it might be you know, three years later. Who knows? Um, and maybe maybe it's got a temporary disconnection, but it'll come back. And so if B gets voted as down, but then it comes back, we need to deal with that. And so what will happen in Orleans is it'll start back up again. It'll it'll see the membership table. It'll see that it's been voted down, and then it'll have to restart itself. And so then it's the same as being crashed because a, a crashed uh, host, Kubernetes will restart it or Service Fabric will restart it. And when they restart, they come back with a different ID. And so that's how Orleans handles these situations. Now, as far as handling this healthy, unhealthy situation, we have a few different tricks. The first one is a, in case A is unhealthy, maybe it's unhealthy, but there's a good chance that C is not. And so we have multiple votes required. So you can't just unilaterally declare that B is down because that would be kind of pandemonium, right? It would be chaos. Um, but, but in addition to that, because that's not always enough, we also have a few other tricks. Uh, for example, we check periodically to see, am I healthy before I declare that B is unhealthy? Um, and we also use this other thing where we probe indirectly. So instead of A checking B, it'll ask C to check B. And it might sound a little confusing, like why, why does that help? But actually it can get a little bit more information um, by going via C. And the, there's some research on that we can talk about. And I'm guessing some of those things are configurable, right? Like those timeouts and oh, you yeah, know, the, yeah. the, all those things should be configurable via code or config file or something of that sort. Uh-huh, yeah, so it's all highly configurable. So we use the, um, you saw in the, hosting example here, um, this configuration, you can configure using the .NET config system, so I option of T. And so there are yeah. options for clustering and for timeouts and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And actually the, the documentation here talks about it. So aka.ms slash Orleans dash clustering will take you to the docs that talk about how clustering works. Um, and then I wanted to link also just towards our, our GitHub and, and everything else. Awesome. And then when it comes to clustering, it looks like we have a couple different options to choose from. I saw mm -hmm. you showed an example of local clustering. There's Redis. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's other things like, I don't know, I'm guessing things like console or etcd. And I'm sure there's a lot of different right. options there if you want to choose. Yeah, there are, there are plugins on NuGet. So if you look at all in stock clustering you'll see in NuGet search, you'll see a bunch of different plugins uh, pop up like uh, like you mentioned, console, Zookeeper is another one, uh, Azure Table Storage or Cosmos DB, Redis. You can even use Kubernetes um, custom resource definitions as clustering. So you can store that cluster information inside of a CRD in Kubernetes. Um, and, and that's a community-driven plugin. And so it's pretty easy, um, I would hope, for the community to contribute uh, clustering plugins. And, and there's a lot of different options, DynamoDB or, or GCP providers as well. Awesome. Hey, Ruben, this has been amazing, man. Again, thank you again so much for sharing all of your knowledge about Orleans and letting us know how clustering works. I'm guessing if folks are interested and they want to reach out to you, they can always follow you on Twitter at Ruben Bond. Uh -huh. And I think that little slide that you showed a little while ago had links to like the GitHub and the Gitter channel and all some other places too that folks go out and you know just interact with the team and submit issues and feedback and stuff like that. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and if you're really keen on this, there's also some research papers that you can look at. You know, if you want to really dive into the the nitty gritty details, a, a lot of uh, because this is a big problem in distributed systems. There's a lot of different papers that you can read on on improvements. Like for example. Lifeguard here, which is actually written by the HashiCorp uh, console folks, um, on some ways that they found some problems and then mitigated them in, in clustering. But it, it's definitely much more theoretical type stuff. But for the practical resources, you can come to us. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you again, Ruben. I really appreciate it. And thank all right. of you for watching. This has been another episode of the On.Net Show, where we learned how clustering works inside of Microsoft Orleans.